Welcome to Tea Smack, home of the Tea Smack. May I take your order? Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Smack, where we talk superheroes, movies, animation, and comics. I am your host, Josh Scar, and joining me this week is the man who just coughed up a ginormous furball. It is Alex. Alex, how you doing? I am doing fantastic. I am excited to live rent-free in your head. Or basement, as the case may be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a cat person, aren't you just kind of living rent-free wherever you go? As you know, you do not adopt a cat. A cat adopts you. And sometimes that just happens by me moving into the basement, seeing that there's available <laughs> space and going, hey, feed me and I'll edit your podcast. This this is mine now. <laughs> so as our favorite tabaxi, Alex, alluded to, we are talking rent-free moments in entertainment this week. These are going to be moments where essentially it just you you walk down the street and you see something and it's like oh it's like that time in that movie or you literally just quote the movie in your head and you're just like god i hope no one sees what's going on inside my head we asked people to let us know what's going on inside their head and they shared so we're going to hear from our friends uh josh and amanda wilson from super familiar with the wilsons and we're going to get right into it we'll be right back the super familiar with the wilsons podcast you know that family whose house you hung out in when you were a kid the house was a little loud and chaotic, but always fun, and sometimes felt more home than home. Well, that's us. We're the Wilsons, and we welcome you into our podcast with silly chat, ridiculous games, and interviews with interesting people. Like a spin doctor. The super familiar with the Wilsons podcast. Welcome home. And we're back. Love Josh and Amanda. They, they are just some of the most wonderful people I have known in the podcasting community. And definitely check out their work. Uh, super familiar with the Wilsons, as well as Unscrew It Up. Uh, some really great stuff in there. And uh, we're going to get into some really great stuff because uh, this this may be our most like nostalgia baity episode ever, but I'm okay with it. Oh, yeah. This is nothing but nostalgia and going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as I mentioned before, uh, hearing from Josh and Amanda, this is moments in entertainment it doesn't have to be like avengers assemble or the portal sequence like those are like iconic moments in cinema Th that's not what we're talking about here the, we're talking about obscure absurd fun stupid whatever kind of moments that just pop into your brain as soon as something just triggers that memory so like for me the example i used when i, I, I did a call out for a few of our social media sites for me this moment lives in my brain every moment of every day and it pops in there probably at least once a week to the surface where it's i found this out this week it's dante bosco in a goofy movie when uh there's the big student assembly happening and roxanne's friend is doing like like yay for another great school year uh the nerd who is yelling at her yo stacy talk to me talk to me talk to me baby that's dante bosco i always assumed that that was um Polly Shore or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is Prince Zuko himself, Jake the Dragon, Rufio, whatever other iconic role he has had. That is the man Dante Bosco. And that just makes that moment so much better. That's fantastic. I I always assumed it was like, like I said, Polly Shore because he had little bit lines and everything, you know, between 1992 and 1998. Well, I mean, Polly Shore is already in a Goofy movie, which we'll get into more moments from a Goofy movie as we we roll along here. Uh, but Alex, what is, what is a moment that lives rent free in your brain? Okay, so this one is decidedly not movies, but it is a children, but it is from a children's show. show. Entertainment. I'm sorry. Well, excuse me, princess. <laughs> <laughs> I, around the age of sixteen or seventeen, became a huge fan of George Carlin, introduced by one of by one of my classmates and i was binging through all of his specials you know the the, the hbo stuff the uh his earlier clean stuff and he had this rant where he is was 
putting down parents and children like you know your children aren't special and all this other crap and he's in like they're all you know they're all the same you think you're you know one's are different from the other all this stuff and out of nowhere he goes you know and he says fuck the children he's like that's right and he's like and i can say that i was mr conductor and all of a <laughs> sudden my mind snapped and i thought back to childhood shiny time station you know three and four years old and my head tilted and i realized that the voice he uses as mr conductor is like the fake voice he uses when he's telling like little stories during the the, sh the show it's the false sincerity kind of thing and ever since then i just carry with me occasionally in my head whenever i think of george carlin or something you know like oh you know george carlin would hate today like live in today's world or, or george carlin warned us about this because he was more of a philosopher than a comedian blah 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 in my head all of a sudden snaps back to his smiling little face in ne in shiny time station introducing the next story and i'm like i ha i have no salvation here i have no i have no safe space i can't get away from this man and then of course he follows the rules of the road as we know from james how bob strike back <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i was older than i care to admit when i realized mr george carlin was mr conductor i remember thinking i had seen um jersey girl where he plays ben affleck's dad i'm just like oh that guy looks familiar i wonder what from and then probably that that jersey girl came out when i was like 16 i think 17 and then i think i watched it again when i was in my early 20s and i'm like that's fucking mr conductor and like it just clicked <laughs> in my brain and i'm just like there's no way and so i had to go through imdb and i was like holy shit like this dude, this amazingly foul mouthed man is Mr. Conductor from the Thomas <laughs> yep. the Tank Engine, like Barney sequence before they go into the Thomas stuff. Like, oh, no yeah. way there. There's and then just like that, that sent me down the rabbit hole of like, let's see what George Carlin is really all about, because I've, I've seen like clips of him and stuff like that. But that's when I really found out like, oh, man, George Carlin is amazing. And actors can have range. <laughs> exactly. And speaks louder than words. <laughs> Probably the most important part of that statement. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you what are you thinking of, Josh, for your rent free moment? Uh, so we, again, we put a call to action. We got a, a lot of responses, which depending on how long this takes us, we, we have uh, a handful all more than a handful already written down. But I have a, a long list of social media pages open that I can just pull from. Uh, but the first one I'm going with is I reached out specifically to Joey Fitz of the video game club, or I'm sorry, game club pod. This one is extraordinarily niche, but I, I, it's Joey. So I got to do it. It's uh Bubba Ray Dudley yelling, get the tables in a, a tag team match back before WWF became the WWE. I have no other context for it other than it's a tag team championship match. And I guess the, the Bubba Ray Dudley and his tag partner are known for table sequences he yells, get the tables, fans shout it with them. And it's everyone's having a great time watching these guys kill themselves. So, Joey, that is the moment that lives rent free in your head is Bubba Ray Dudley yelling, get the tables. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a few wrestling moments that live rent free in my brain, too. Like uh, I will I was at WrestleMania 13. So the the Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Bret Hart match, the, the submission match where Stone no. Cold got cut. I was there. I was 13 years old. I, I still remember watching Bret Hart walk up the, the aisle and flipping people off. But like I was oh, I had awesome. a view of the entryway. So like I also saw that iconic Stone Cold glass breaking moment of him walking out the tunnel. Uh, like I think that was one of the first times they ever did that was at WrestleMania 13. So like that, that was, that's a, just such a cool memory. But again, those are like iconic moments and that's not really what we're going for with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but those do live rent free in my brain just because, again, like 20 some odd years ago, my dad was like, yeah, it's going on at the, the Rosemont Horizon at the time, what it was at the time. And now it's all state arena. Let, let's see what these tickets cost and see where we can set. See this entire sequence, all I could hear in my head was <gasps> "Bone Saw is ready." <laughs> <laughs> That's another one that was rent free in my head. Anytime someone talks about Randy Savage, I'm just like, that man bulked up so hard and like hit the roids and juice and everything in between, and just got so massive from like 1998 to 2002, and it's just like probably why he had a heart attack. 
<laughs> oh, but true. Yeah. Uh, so we again, Alex, feel free to go through the list, pull one of yours, or uh, if you got another one that uh, you want to talk about real quick, let's get into that one. Okay, so McKay Findlay, rent free moment is from Cat in the Hat, where Michael Myers says, Well, Mike Myers says, You're not wrong, you're stupid, and you're ugly, just like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is probably one of the best lines of that abomination. If, if I remember, that one's also said like extraordinarily aggressively. So oh, yeah. it's just like, you're not just wrong. You're fat and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, oh my God, dude. Like this is supposed to be a kid friendly movie, like chill out. Um, but that one, I, I haven't seen that movie. I've, I've seen bits of it, but I've still not subjected myself to it. But the meme that McKay sent us with that one broke my brain because it's the possessive your and not the contraction your, uh. and I, I am, I am a grammar police person. And that one just like, typing it out at, while reading it. I'm like, uh, my head, this is like leaving my brain because of this, or this might live rent free in my brain because of this meme. Cause it, it's not a meme unless it's spelled poorly. <laughs> oh, what you thinking, Josh, for your next one? Let's go with this one. Cause it, I, I do have a tie in with this one. Uh, we have from Kirk Brackman. He's talking about uh, a moment in 300 when, which this is another thing I, I remember certain moments from 300, but I do not remember what Lena Headey's character's name was. Uh, apparently her name is Queen Gorgo. Yeah. I, you you could have asked me that question. I would <laughs> not have known what that is. You could have told me, told me, asked me who's Gorgo in, uh, in 300. I would have said the, the hunchback. I don't know. But uh, Kirk says, one thing I can't stand, uh, one thing I can't unsee is in 300, a movie I love after Queen Gorgo kills Theron, one of the council members immediately turns to her, turns towards the camera with his fist in the air to start shouting traitor before anyone else. And it's super awkward. And I hate that I can never not see that in the scene. I think it. I think about it all the time, rent free indeed. So, I mean, I need an excuse to go back and watch 300 or maybe I don't, I don't know, but the idea of someone doing some really bad acting and <laughs> like getting ahead of their mark. Uh, that one led me into thinking about another really, there's two really bad quotes or line deliveries in Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl. One of them is uh, when they first think they broke the spell after they cut Elizabeth's hand, Barbosa shoots one of the guy, one of the two like main comedic sidekick guys. And another guy just like looks at him after he gets shot and he goes, you are not dead. Oh like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you couldn't. You that that was the take you wanted with that one. <laughs> it, not, not you're not dead. Not, not like you're still alive. I, I don't know. But like that's the line you wanted was you are not dead. And then he goes, "You shot me," <laughs> <laughs> which that line is delivered wonderfully. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure there's a cut in between. So again, the guy going, "You are not dead," is just like what is happening here? Why is this the line you went with? And then the other line that I really, the other line that I really don't think is delivered very well is when Elizabeth is walking the plank. And I, I believe the guy is supposed to be the first mate. He just yells too long. Like, <laughs> again, that's the take. That's the one that you're like, nailed it. Go moving on. Perfect. So this just reminded me of one that definitely lives um, with my wife and I, we love the first mummy. The second one, is not as good, but there's some prize moments. But at the end, when um, the Scorpion King is there, uh, Rick gets the spear lance thingy, and he jabs the Scorpion King, therefore, you know, killing him. From the they they cut from this shot of him kind of dangling over the pit of the damned, spear up into the the Scorpion King, and then he says like some one liner, and then twists the spear, which I'm not which they've showed it just to be like a a cylindrical spear. So what does the twisting do? doesn't like spin a blade, but it's like, yeah, now you're dead. They cut to like a frame shot left, uh, right side of the screen, the, uh, the Scorpion King, he's dangling Rick, you know, um, Brandon Frazier is dangling in the middle of the pit. And then from off screen stage, you know, uh, screen left, runs in the mummy who dropped to his knees and then goes, no, <laughs> it is like two beats too late. 
And it is so dramatic of like step, step, slide, knees, no, <laughs> that we just burst out laughing. Did an editor not think of to get another uh, angle or go like, let's trim half a second here? It's just half a second. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I actually saw a really good video about that. Um, I think I was just scrolling through TikTok and uh, it was one of those moments where someone's nitpicking uh, the choice of camera angles where like someone's hair is like in their face and then they cut to a different angle and their hair is tied nicely in the back and then they cut back to a different shot and the hair is loose again. The edit, a, a person who is like, I went to school for editing. I am a professional editor. I'm part of the editor's guild. This was not an editor. This is the director saying no one will notice. And oh. I, would, I would almost bet that in that moment, that was probably the director of the mummy going, I need this, this, and this to happen before we get to the no. Ew. Okay. Well, then I blame him, but he hasn't acted, he hasn't directed in like 10 years. So, yeah. So they, they, <laughs> the, the person was talking about how um, editors are, are, they, they go through every like pixel of a, a, of a shot to make sure that cinema sins and other internet nerds will not, nitpick this movie and then the director will go no one's gonna notice and and that's kind of part of why we're in such a weird situation with hollywood as we are is because there's so many things where they're just like if we're gonna reshoot and no one's gonna notice it's fine okay so this obviously horrible tangent but we have been we have rewatched true lies because it's one of our favorite movies and oh yeah it's fantastic have you ever noticed that the scene where um they drug uh, Schwarzenegger and Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, she's tied to a chair. He's there. He's been drugged. They're going to torture him, all that stuff. And she's asking him a bunch of questions, you know, where she finds out, you know, he's been a spy forever, et cetera, et cetera. Have you noticed that between her knees is a grenade? Can't say that I have. No. So here's the funny thing about that. Cause I finally noticed it. Cause I paused it and, you know, got some water, came back and Liz was like, is that, a? and I'm like, it is. And so then we, we back up and okay. It's there in a previous shot just a brief shot because you know it's mostly a shot from like her chest up and his chest up but then there's some framing shots and there it is it's not there at the beginning and there's a it's there and then it's there again and then it's gone and then after they escape he he kills some people and there's a big explosion uh big firefight he grabs her he pulls a grenade from his back pocket and throws it i do remember that that's an iconic moment yeah yeah so we looked it up apparently it was it was a really late in production decision that the scene was taking too long the bad guy like pulls the print, pin from the grenade puts the grenade between her legs and says like don't like open your legs and then like drops the pin and there's something you know some stuff happens interrogation starts killing people comes back over frees her takes the grenade puts the pin in puts it in his back pocket and he and james cameron went no one's going to notice the grenade there. We can shave <laughs> off like 45 seconds. And yeah, I never questioned where the grenade came from that he throws. I just feel like, oh, yeah, he probably killed some people, picked it up off of them. Of course, yeah, he has a grenade it's, it's on not him. the point of the, the moment. <laughs> yeah, but now that I've noticed it, I can't unsee that there's a grenade suddenly there. <laughs> uh, anyway, long That's tangent. Fine. I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. So, you got any, what, what's your next one here for you? I, oh, that's right. Okay, Josh. After going from comedy, let's go to a little bit of seriousness. Goodwill Hunting. Great movie, Academy Award winning, all this stuff. This one actually didn't live rent free with me until the last like six years or so of my life, where I've I definitely believe in mental health and you know seeking assistance where you need it. And I I it's I've never hid that I've been in some you know some kind of therapy for the last little while for anxiety and some depression and other stuff. And it wasn't until about two or three years ago that Goodwill Hunting was on. I decided to watch it because, you know, I haven't seen it forever. I remember kind of liking it when it came out when I was a teenager and, you know, the jokes were funny and all this crap. And it got to the scene with Robin Williams and Matt Damon, and they're talking about abuse and all this, you know, stuff and things that are caught, walls that you put up and facades you build with yourself, within yourself to just get through the day. Rob Williams says, like, it's not your fault. And he goes, like, yeah, I know, I know. And he says, no, it's not your fault. And that scene, just the repeating of the words until you accept it. Live with me. Because it is so true that until you go through the hard work of, like, you know, asking for help and looking for help or stuff like that, and until you actually accept that some things aren't your fault, that some things just happened, 
your your circumstance it lives with me and part of the reason why it lives with me a lot is that is being through therapy but also robin williams can actually fucking act <laughs> oh yeah yes he oh, yeah man. he's a genie his special um live on broadway from like 2003 or something like that is fantastic i remember i actually was laughing so hard that when i took a sip of water i was drowning briefly laughing so hard from it <laughs> i i own that dvd yeah that was fantastic yeah, yeah but to actually realize that some that for all his bombastic personality mrs doubtfire good morning vietnam the dead poet society uh, being a lot you know being the genie and all this stuff that when he actually took a moment to go quiet and to actually have something meaningful, that scene just really st- sticks with me. And occasionally, when I'm feeling down or like a little bit of you know anxiety or something like that, it does help me just suddenly remember like some of this is not my fault, but it is my obligation to get help. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, not a happy go lucky one, but I, I it it it's meaningful to me. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, we can we can do a real easy transition here because I can follow up with another meaningful one. Um, the the moment in a goofy movie where uh they're roaring down the river after the the car goes uh a wall on them max and goofy are having this big argument where uh goofy's just like i just want to go fishing and max like i'm not your little boy anymore and then goofy says you're my son no matter how old you get you'll always be my son and that i, I was 10 years old when a goofy movie came out and that moment struck a chord with me because very around that time, I also kind of realized that my parents are older than other people's parents. I, I, my parents were just always my parents. I never thought about their age. And then I remember one day I was doing, uh, I I had a basketball league that I was in and one of my teammates was like, Oh, is that your grandpa? I was like, no, that's my dad. Then like the next time I watched a goofy movie, that moment came up again. And I kind of realized that one of the reasons my dad liked spending so much time with me is because I was his son. I'm just a little 10 year old, 11 year old snot nosed kid. That's just like, Oh God, my dad just won't let me go play power Rangers or won't let me play with my toys. He wants to take me places and teach me how to do things. And then I, I, once I heard that line again, it just, it hit me that he just wants to spend time with me. He wants to know who I am. He wants to know what it is that makes me tick. He wants to just be a part of my life in some way. And I, I talked about this with uh, my Goofy movie ex- uh, discussion with Antonio on the Cult Worthy, which check it out. I think it's still like it, one of his top 10 most downloaded episodes. But that one just really hit me because, again, my I always viewed my dad a little bit like Goofy, but in a different context because Goofy is just annoying and embarrassing because he's Goofy. But I had a different context with my dad being old and he, being from a different generation from a lot of uh, other parents. So like I, I knew that there was there's there's always a ticking clock like i'm not taking away anything from anyone who lost their their parents at a young age especially their dad i got to be with my dad for over 35 years so like i'm extraordinarily grateful but knowing my dad was older than other dads i knew that there wasn't as much time with him or there was the potential for not as much time so that moment is always in my brain of like goofy just explain expressing himself in the most simplistic way possible that yeah you're growing up that doesn't mean that you can't spend time with your parent or that your parent doesn't love you and doesn't deserve to know who you are. That's really sweet. Well, yeah. Never, that never hit me that way. Other than he was just really well animated that moment, the music, the animation, the way they actually make you feel for goofy, you know? Yeah. And, and like a goofy you know, movie is one of those, uh, it's one of those movies that's like, they didn't have to go that hard, but they did. <laughs> Uh, but transitioning out of that, we also have a, a submission from Kate Salerno, which this one everyone knew is coming. It's, hey, Max, it's the Leaning Tower of Chisa, <laughs> which that's in my brain all the time. So is also a little smokage. <laughs> that movie deserves more love than it gets. Pretty much any any Pauly Shore moment in that <laughs> little slurpage. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> any any moment with Bobby Pauly Shore uh, in that movie is just instantly quotable. And I, like I said, this isn't supposed to be like iconic lines, but I don't know if a goofy movie is iconic in that sense. It's definitely part of our generation. So like we we remember it and we love it. 
but it's not quite, I don't think, in, in the public zeitgeist that and you could walk up to someone and be like, it's the Leaning Tower of Chisa. And everyone would be like, oh, my God, a goofy movie. I love that movie. No, you'd, you'd have some so. people being like, what the hell is wrong with this person? <laughs> and that's what we're going for. OK, so I'm going to go with Robert Shirley from Robin Hood Men in Tights, the guy who screams during the wedding ceremony. Hey, I bet. Hate that guy. I hate that guy. I have <laughs> no idea what that's referencing. I have no idea if it's referencing a TV show. I have no idea if it's referencing a movie. Uh, maybe Robert Shirley can tell me. I remember once kind of vaguely looking at like Googling, like what the fuck does Hey Abbott mean while watching it. But it, it does stick in your head. Cause it's, I'm sure that there is a generation of people who are like, Oh yeah, that's a great reference to like the honeymooners <laughs> episode four where blah, blah, I have no clue. But yes, it's great and stupid. <laughs> and thank I always you, assumed Robert it was Shirley. like the voice and like it's just supposed to be like this annoying guy because like the abbot's like walking down the aisle and he's like, oh, yeah, bless you. Bless you. Great for being here. Bless you. Bless you. And then you have the annoying guy. Hey, abbot. No, I <laughs> oh, I hate that guy. <laughs> like it, it's I think it's just supposed to be funny and ironic or yeah, ironic that like the priest is like, oh, this fucking guy. It could be as simple as that. It is still a great line. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's still a, a, another movie with fantastic moments. Yeah, like it, it's it's just quotable. Um, like the 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 moment where Dave Chappelle's character is like, "Hey, Blinken," and he's like, "Did you say a Blinken?" He's like, "No, man, I said hey, Blinken." <laughs> yep. And that's one where, like, if someone does mention a Blinken, I'm like, "Did you say hey, Blinken?" And they just look at me. When he's up in the tree and they're like, what are you doing up there? I'm listening for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we did get uh, another submission from Rory High. Uh, he he talked about the uh, I'm I am your worst nightmare from Mulan with Mushu. Uh, but this one is the one that. I'm, I was going to like maybe try and soundbite because I was like, oh, we're only going to get like 15 submissions, maybe. Uh, maybe I'll soundbite all of these so we can share them. But we got over 50 submissions. So like, thank you to everyone who did participate. Uh, but Rory high says there are several, but naturally I suddenly can't remember 99% of them. So many from the Simpsons, but specifically when Santa's little helper says chewy in Homer's voice. And th this moment uh, just needs to be heard. I can't do it justice just by reading Rory's thoughts. So here's this moment from the Simpsons uh, Homer. I believe this is the episode where Homer and Lisa are like, working as journalists together where Lisa is basically doing the writing and Homer's the face. And then Lisa decides she doesn't like how Homer's operating. So Homer's going to do things his own way. What's a good word? Sucks. That's great. And the bread was really, come on, help me out here. Ruff. Ruff. Yeah, I don't know. You've been pitching that all night. Chewy. Chewy. <laughs> That's <just spoke. laughs> so good i forgot about that moment but yes yeah, that is classic simpsons ridiculousness which i mean we could do an entire episode just on like innocuous moments from the simpsons but uh another one for me is um there's an episode i don't remember the context of it but homer's out late at night i think he and marge have a fight or something or he's feeling upset that he's fat and he's just wandering late at night and then he sees this building with big neon letters that just says G Y M. And Homer goes, Gime? What's a Gime? <laughs> and then you cut to Homer walking in, seeing all the guys working out. And he goes, Oh, a Gime. <laughs> <laughs> And every time I pass by a Planet Fitness, uh, a 24 uh, Athletic or whatever they're called, I just think, Gaim, what's a Gaim? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't remember this line because I purged this movie from my head, but Nader Adela from the Justice League, the Whedon cut. <laughs> you smell nice. Did I not before? As Lois tells Clark, who's newly resurrected, <laughs> I think I can vaguely remember this abomination of like a delivery in line, but who the hell writes that? <laughs> Joss I mean, Whedon. I mean, we know who wrote it, but yeah, I just, uh Yeah, I, I, I can't say I remember that line either, but I can definitely see why that would stick in someone's brain. 
Henry Cavill is a good actor. Um, you know, he's he was great as the Witcher. He was great as Reload Arm Guys in the Mission Impossible movies. He's <laughs> he's done some good stuff. But gentle, suave charisma is not one of them. <laughs> and it takes a special kind of dumbass to do that horrible of a line. <laughs> not he's a dumbass, but that dumbass line being written for somebody to salvage that. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know if it's the dumbest line I've ever heard in a movie. Um, I would have to go deep into the annals of my brain to to know that it's the dumbest line. But I, I think that could be up there if I remembered anything from the Justice League, as it is so dubbed. Um, another thing I don't quite remember, but again, friend of the show, Dan from Casting Views, wrote in and he said the Game of Thrones finale, specifically season eight, where Cersei runs down the stairs. I'm assuming past the the fight between the two. <laughs> Yep. Uh, the brothers. I have a vague memory of that moment, but I don't remember her running down the stairs looking particularly funny or weird. But Dan did also comment with a gif of gut ducks running around. And she's he's just like, this reminds me of that moment. <laughs> and so I'm like, OK. Yeah, I, I vaguely remember that because I, I was in that moment. I was like, oh, cool. It, you know, we're getting the hound, uh, the hound mountain fight or some mountain or whatever, you know, the Klieger bowl, but Clegane bowl. That's right. Clegane bowl. Thank you. Klieger sounds better. But I look, but yeah, I remember like her running in like, in you know, there's the hound and she kind of stops and kind of looks back and forth. And then she kind of like, hikes her skirt, her like, you know, the front of her skirt up a little bit and then kind of jogs around him and keeps going. And I was just like, dude, dude, you, 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 you know, people hate her. You, you could just swing and then go after the brother. I mean, no one's going to, no one's going to stop you. <laughs> End this right now before, I don't know, they, a, a small pile of, of bricks kills them. <laughs> yeah. I think the, uh, the pitch meeting guy recently did a, a season eight game of Thrones thing. And <laughs> that was, that was really good. Cause he's just kind of like, and then this is going to happen. Like, well, isn't there a whole buildup in it? Like, don't want to do it. Don't care. Moving on. So Josh, if I was to reference Chris Monk and his submission from Ghostbusters 2, if I were to say Doe, what would you say? I'd say Ray. And then I would say Egon. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love Harold Ramis's little smirk at the end of that too, where he's just like, yeah, I made a joke. That movie is not great, but it it's, has some it's great not, moments. But th that courtroom scene is fantastic. Oh, yeah. uh, which that that's another tie in that I have for moments that live in my brain, because like the the two in the box ready to go. We be fast and they be slow. They be slow. That yep. moment. I, I love that moment. That's such a great like we're back moment. Mm -hmm. We're back a dinosaur story. That's another good one. <laughs> great. Now that's in my head. Thank you. <laughs> my dreams tonight are going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of random, like animated features that don't really linger in the public consciousness, but people remember them. One of the greatest pieces of edutainment animated propaganda from the 1990s, Fern Gully, the, the last rainforest starring Robin Williams as Batty the bat who has been tested on by science labs and probably makeup places and whatever else was going on in the nineties. I can hear it in my head. Obviously I cannot deliver it the way Robin Williams would, but like, I don't remember much of that movie other than like the oil monster that possesses a giant wrecking rig. But Robin Williams is batty. Uh, he says, price check on prune juice, Bob, price check on prune juice. And I, I, <laughs> I can hear it, but I, I, I have no context for it. But like, again, it's one of those random Robin Williams moments where I'm sure he was improvising and mm -hmm. they're just like fantastic. Cut it, print it, animate it. We don't have anything for it, but we'll, we're going to make something for it. All I remember... Um around the time that came out was all of a sudden like seven or eight year old me thought girls with short black hair were really cute <laughs> oh yeah the pixie cut became a huge thing at that time mm -hmm. little on at the least, nose at least for like <laughs> at least for like four months until the vhs came out and then it was like another two weeks <laughs> and then the vhs came and went and everyone's like what what movie was that what are you talking about <laughs> So I have two from the Spider-Man franchise. Reed uh, Wasson, he says he and his wife have got to the stage where if one of us has a hot take to share, someone will say, okay, say the line. And the other responds, tell me the truth. I'm ready to hear it. For in the end of Spider-Man 1, which they say is the best super movie hero, uh, superhero movie of all time. So they give us an example. Say the, say the line. Tell me the truth. I'm ready to hear it. 
sweet potato fries are worse than regular fry and are more expensive. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That's super sweet and also factual. <laughs> I have nothing against that one. That's 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 really good. Ben Southgate from Spider Man Two, and I this actually recontextualizes that moment for me because I actually have never interpreted the way that they did. Um, so I'm gonna have to actually go back and rewatch the scene. But Mary Jane is um, on stage and she notices Peter in the audience and she stumbles over her line of "I am glad" in disbelief. And now, whenever I say "I am glad," this short scene plays in my head. I always thought that that was like her just being a bad actress like in in the in the in that world that you watch movies yeah. differently <laughs> yeah i never i never actually got it that she was shocked by him being there but i may have just also been glazing over that part in the movie like get to the part where he fights somebody <laughs> <laughs> yes uh spider-man 2 i i love that movie but there are some moments that, that i'm just like uh, superhero movies were different in 2002. Like the one joke Spider-Man tells in the entire trilogy is here's your change. And that that's another moment that lives rent free in my brain, mostly because I'm just like, that was the one joke they used. That was the joke. And it was a <laughs> literal punchline. It just, Sam, I understand you're going for the misery porn with the Parker luck and everything. And you're homaging a lot of the early years of Spider-Man uh, the Ditko Stan Lee eras specifically, but like go back and read those comics. Peter's not that depressed back then. He says a lot of funny stuff. He thinks a lot of funny stuff. Here's your change is like one of the worst lines you could have delivered. And I mean, it, it is pretty on par with Spider-Man, but it doesn't fit your Toby Spider-Man, <laughs> but it kind of does at the same time. It's a really weird mix. One thing I'm going to plug here real quick uh, is watching stuff has been going through the Raimi trilogy and I, I cannot recommend listening to it enough because uh, they're getting into Spider-Man three. I don't know. I don't think it'll have been released yet by the time this episode comes out. It might be this coming weekend or it will have been last weekend before this episode came out. So it it either has just happened or it will just happen. Go back and listen to Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3 because Matt and I have very different takes on Spider-Man 3, and uh, especially in the sense that like evil emo Peter is what that interpretation of Peter would interpret to be evil, which like, yeah, the symbiote makes you evil, but it also it manipulates your personality in that way. So that Peter would be like, oh yeah, me, me doing the bangs and the listening to good <laughs> Charlotte, that that's what's going to make me evil. <laughs> uh it looks like i'm rewatching the spider-man trilogy this weekend <laughs> <laughs> so alex this is one that you and i can can just we could endlessly quote this one i just sent you a video about it i think earlier in the week uh the three amigos like where do you begin with moments that just live in your oh, yeah. brain rent free one of the moments that i just always think about is the moment where they're infiltrating the, the hollywood studio and Steve Martin's like doing lookout, trying to help them get in without getting noticed. And he's doing this like, who, 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 trying to get Ooh. Chevy Chase and uh, look. Martin Short to notice him. And he's just Ooh. being loud and obnoxious and look, 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 look. make the most absurd noises. Ooh. And they're just like look up here. looking around, <laughs> look up here. Look up here. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just I, I hear that look up here look up here look up here i hear that in my head look up ev here, every so look often. up here <laughs> you yes. you too hey, look up here guys <laughs> <laughs> i love that moment it, it, that lives in my brain forever and ever and uh there's one that is very important to you so i'll let you discuss that one so at my uh at at, at, at my wedding, you know, you have to do the, the father daughter dance and the, the mother son dance. And my wife and her dad dance to this lovely song together. My mom and I dance to my little buttercup. <laughs> Love it. And, and my wife being the amazing woman that she is, she knew her cue. Cause when my mom and I pointed to her for the, the, the part, cause we just snipped the, you know, snipped it out of the movie as is she did the bar. She stood up and did the bartenders. My little buttercup. <laughs> full on oh I, I love that scene especially like oh we're a little rusty uh <laughs> then they just yep. pull off like a seamless <laughs> number <laughs> do you know how it's a male plane the little balls <laughs> i'm gonna kiss you on the veranda 
the lips would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sweater. <laughs> Are amigos, fa- uh, no, are gringos falling from the sky? Yes, oh, guapo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, the, the clip I had sent you was um, Martin Short and Steve Martin at uh, uh, doing Conan O'Brien's podcast, uh, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. And uh, they're, they're just having a great time talking about it. And um, Steve Martin talks about how he got like, I think he he wrote two jokes into the movie, like everything else was written. Uh, by the the writing staff but he did the it's a sweater and he also did the moment at the end of the movie where i believe her name is louisa is the the woman there uh partnering or who like called them in where at the end of the movie uh there's like this insinuated romance between them or budding romance and he gives her a kiss and he says i'll come back one day and she goes why (laughs) (laughs) okay now i'm just thinking about the um Oh crap! What is Martin uh, Martin Short's character's name? But as they're all going, they're out in the middle of nowhere, and they played a song, and they're singing a song to put him to sleep. Everyone says good night to him, <laughs> including <laughs> yes. the animals and rabbits and <laughs> bats. And it's like, I love the turtle. What? Good night, Ned. Good night. <laughs> the singing oh. bush. Like again, this is another one like a goofy movie where we could just endlessly quote it because there's so many moments. I love the when they accidentally shoot the invisible <laughs> the invisible man it, it just like they drop a rock on him and they like lift his arm you see the little thud of everything and uh he's just like he's dead <laughs> how was i supposed to know he's there <laughs> they're going through the desert they're all parched as hell and uh <laughs> dusty bottoms Put you know, takes out his thing, dr- splashes like his face, drinks some of it in the water, chucks it off th- to the side where it, the canteen is just dribbling out water. It has lip balm, puts it on, and it goes <laughs> lip balm. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> uh, fantastic movie. That's that's yeah. one I gotta go back and watch. I haven't seen that one in a, a couple of years. So uh, the one that I, I, I will have is that this is one one of my wife and I's favorite film. It's a movie from 2008, super low budget sci-fi kind of sci-fi channel movie called Yeti curse of the snow demon. It is about high school, college soccer team or whatever crash land. And of course there's a Yeti starts killing them off, you know, cheesy horror flick. But one of the things that just drives us nuts about, and we love to tell people like, this is how bad of a movie it's going to be. It's going to be fantastic. Is that they're getting out they're out, out of the plane. It's the survivors. The plane is on fire behind them, like five feet away. You can see the bad, you know, CGI fire of the engine and everything. And the group goes, okay, we need to coordinate. Okay, one of the first things we're going to need, does anyone know how to make fire? Okay, let's get materials for fire. And they go start looking for sticks. <laughs> the plane is on fire right behind them. <laughs> and it is horrible. I mean, and that's, that's immediately when you know, we're in for a good time. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do. Uh, we've got a couple of sentimental ones still to do here, and then we're gonna just close out with a a bang with the rest of these. But I, I'm gonna talk about my my mother in law. She saw the the call to action that I put out. She follows our social medias. For her, one that lives in her brain is uh, the last line of the movie Ever After. This is more sentimental, like I said. Um, it's really cheesy. I haven't seen ever after since like high school. And so like, I don't remember it, but it's uh, so did, worth watching. I did look it up just to see, but like, uh, the, the ending line is while Cinderella and her prince did live happily ever after the point is they lived. And like, I, I remember the context of it and like, yeah, it, it is a very poignant line for a, a nice twist on the Cinderella story. But the, to find out that my mother-in-law of all people is someone who like has that living in their brain i'm like oh that's that's kind of neat so not as sentimental but when my wife and i were first getting together bruce campbell was having a movie on sci-fi channel called alien apocalypse and being young and dumb i was very much like uh hey listen i know we're visiting but we have to watch this movie because it's premiering and i love bruce campbell and it, it's a horrible movie where he plays like a doctor who lands in the future of earth where in of course like it's overtaken by like mantis aliens or something like that 
and but he's a doctor and he still remembers how to be one and people of course you know people are being enslaved by these mantises and don't know medical technology and stuff so he's been he's helping them and one of the guys screws up really badly and he bruce campbell's character pulls a gun at him and says and to kill him and the guy goes but you're, you're a doctor you're supposed to help people and campbell says as only he can your stupidity is terminal <laughs> and kills him <laughs> I heard my uh, my mother in law snort <laughs> because they had been kind of like politely grumping that like we're really we're we're doing this we're watching this this is really bad I'm like just like I love this what I love about it is that from that day forward every once in a while just when somebody did something dumb or she would just kind of chuckle to herself and and she would go your stupidity is terminal. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just so good, you know, it, that, you know, I, I'm glad I have that memory with her. Um, and of course, Liz, uh, my wife mentions it now and then she, she will say like, like she will mention it and we'll just kind of chuckle. And it's a, it's a good rent free bonding moment. Yeah. So uh, the last sentimental one that I have is the, basically the last like 10 minutes of, uh, or five minutes of Coco Pixar's Coco, the remember me sequence, uh, and, uh, me proud Corazon as a, a dad and like specifically a girl dad the moment when Hector sees Coco again in the afterlife just like uh that that part kills me every time like I could literally just turn that moment on and like my eyes will start welling up more specifically the the moment where Miguel is singing to Coco where she comes back um, that one also hits me real hard because my great aunt lived with us for a little while and she had Alzheimer's or dementia um, I don't remember. I think it was Alzheimer's was what she was diagnosed with. But just seeing how like that sort of disease takes that the person away and seeing how hearing that song brought back Grandma Coco, um, it just it it was fantastic. And it, it's another moment that just breaks my heart in, in a good way. And it uh, just is, is it's pick Coco is like maybe well I, I I liked Elemental but I think Coco as of right now is probably Pixar's most recent great film yeah I um I, I can only agree with you about Coco and especially those last few moments because I had a very annoyed viewing of that movie be just because being Hispanic and, you know, I think it was written and directed by like some, you know, I was like grumping about like, what are these white people all in California? No, what's blah, blah, blah. And so I was getting just sitting there and, and angry because of course it's like, you know, it's Mexico. So of course it's the desert, I'm not forgetting that Mexico has forests and mountains and stuff. So I'm like, oh, no, no, no. and they're going to the line of dead. And, and I was just refusing to allow myself to enjoy the beauty of it. And then, as you said, it got to those last 10 minutes. And like you, with the grandmother scene and him playing for her, that's what finally broke me. Because having, you know, especially in Mexican culture, just having your older family around you, like people call you, you know, what you may call your grandmother, who aren't even related grandmother, just because the family and the community comes around. And builds up, a, you know, and builds up, a, you built around with friends of friends of friends of friends and acceptance and being around each other. And I have a moment in my life that is similar to that one. And that is what finally got me because I'm like, holy shit, they, they, they know, they get it. And just tears. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just a, a fantastically crafted moment. And uh, like you, you're invested in the stakes, even once you're out of the land of the dead. And back in the land of the living, like there, there's just that great use of the the ticking clock, where you just you can't even see Coco's psyche slipping, but you you feel it through Miguel's distress, and you're just like, oh no, Hector, what's gonna happen? And then the movie just hits you with the feels when you see Hector and Coco in in the afterlife together, and it's like, I don't even care that this doesn't make sense with the context of the movie anymore. They're together again. Yeah. So my last cinema one is a little bit of a cheat because it's the movie The Godfather. My wife and I, uh, her dad and I never, just the way things work out, we just never really spend a lot of time alone together. Well, her dad and her the stepmom were visiting and they went off to do something, leaving me and her dad alone together. 
on one of the, the premium channels is the godfather just so happens to be and it was somewhere in the beginning uh like really early in the movie you know it's like a three and a half hour movie man um so what happens is we just quietly watched it and we're just kind of here in, in, uh, now and then we would say something like you know like oh that was good or like oh yeah this part or we're just, and then we kind of like occasionally make a reference like talk to each other little things of why we like this movie and stuff like that but it was just really surreal that we were just there for like three four hours just watching this movie that we both enjoyed that both had some meaning to us it was one of the few times that i like felt like yeah he likes me (laughs) 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 we have something in common he's okay with me being alive (laughs) i know i married his daughter but still (laughs) he could take me out at any moment (laughs) No, that, that's really cool. I, I've had a couple of moments like that with uh, with my own father in law, and uh, again, it's it's a real relief when you you hear or at least get the context from the father in law or the in laws in general, where they're like, "Yeah, we respect you and we like you, and we're happy that you make our our child happy." It's like, "Yay, I'm doing things right." <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so we've got a couple of uh, a mutual couple of mutual friends of ours. Uh, so I'm not going to say their names. Uh, we've got Brian P from. Uh, doesn't matter where he's from uh he, he's <laughs> referencing uh, the princess bride uh the anybody got a peanut rhyme which i i cannot i hear andre the giant but actually this moment it, i have a similar rent-free moment but it's in i love you man where paul rudd and uh, jason siegel's characters are like out drinking jason siegel reveals that his he can do a an an Andre the Giant impression. Hey, anybody got a peanut? <laughs> Which obviously I can't do. But the the Princess Bride again is an endlessly quotable movie. The I don't you you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Moment like that's in my brain all the time. So like thank you Brian. And then we've also got from Ted E, another mutual friend of ours. He's he he's talking about an iconic moment. So we're not going to dwell on it too much. But uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, the car sequence from Wayne's World. Obviously everyone knows that one. For me, from Wayne's World, a, a rent free moment is the the sponsorship moment where Rob Lowe is trying to explain to them like this is how it's done. If you want to stay in the, in the big big leagues with these with everyone else you have to do sponsorships and they go back and forth with like i will not bow to any sponsor and then dana carvey as garth is like it's like people only do things because they get paid and that's just sad i love that moment i (laughs) he's wearing reebok but just the line delivery is so perfect and it caps off that joke so well from that movie for me it's it's simple no stairway denied (laughs) especially i think it's on the dvd commentary but apparently they actually had to go to led zeppelin and actually ask them how many notes they could play before they would have to pay like the five hundred thousand dollars for the song and they had to submit and they submitted like a few different times before finally got to like well out three (laughs) oh that's awesome uh another friend of the show greg beaver submitted a, a moment uh he just said the red wedding uh, Rob's wife is stabbed so viciously that I, Greg, still think about it. The brutality of all this years, all these years later. And that's fair. Like, yeah, her getting stabbed in the stomach and getting her throat slit. Just ugh, the, the Red Wedding was mm-hmm. that that was like the Game of Thrones moment where everyone like just went insane for yeah. for the series and just like what's going to happen next. And we we've talked about this a few times, but. I think Game of Thrones might have been the last like thing to Game of Thrones might have been what broke the week to week model because Mm -hmm. Netflix obviously has its thing with binging. But when Game of Thrones didn't stick the landing with season eight, I think a lot of studios just went, well, we're fucked. So let's just get it over with instead of like, let's just not make bad finales. If people don't want to give us the time to do the finale, then we'll go out. We'll we'll get a new executive producer in and make sure this is done properly. Mm -hmm. So I I wonder if that there is some merit to that where Game of Thrones. I I mean, there has to be some merit to it because like Game of Thrones is the last show where I really remember like the world sat down and watched that show as it debuted. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, oh, the nerds stay up and watch Ahsoka when it turns on at 8, 9 p.m. Eastern on disney plus on tuesday everyone else will just watch it at their leisure yeah stranger things drops their 
six episodes and then everyone talks about it for three days and then moves on. Yep. It's actually, that would be a good, that'd be a good thing to actually go back and like, so what killed viewing? <laughs> I mean, I, I do now that I'm ta- thinking about it, I, I feel like it has to be game of Thrones. That show was getting, I think season six, seven and eight, somewhere between 30 to 40 th- uh, million an episode. There was, you know, I mean, that's not as much as like Friends was getting, you know, in their heyday and certainly not Seinfeld's like 45 a million. And then, of course, like 90 for the finale. But it was something that seemed to be uniting us as a, you know, as a cultural watching. But yeah, they broke it. Bastards. Yeah. And like the, the production timeline also, like, I feel like that broke TV as well, because uh, as Matt discussed in our last What You Doing TV used to be a thing where, or no, maybe it was the Star Trek Strange New Worlds episode where the season would end in like mid to late May. It would usually end on a cliffhanger and then you got to wait till September. Now a season ends and you have to wait bare minimum a year until the next season. Like Loki debuted in what, October of 2021? Yeah. Something like that. And yeah, because 2020 was when Disney Plus launched. So October of 2021, Loki comes out. We're now getting season two, almost a full two years later. And like I get they put they 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 basically are just cutting up a movie, but there there is something that's broken in TV production that's not just like sitcoms or competitive based reality TV shows like the the Amazing Race or American Ninja Warrior. There's yeah. something that's broken in the production process. Yeah, and the thing is, viewers are not hanging around. Unless a show super catches on, viewers are not hanging around to keep watching it because it is too long. It is just far too distant. I mean, if you binged it, you know, six to ten episodes two and a half years ago, do you really want to come back? Yeah, so you're right. That production is broken. It. The question becomes with the length between these shows, do we want to return? And unfortunately, like, apparently The Witcher 3, even though it's supposed to be Henry Cavill's big send-off, barely touched the top ten at all is waiting 18 months to two years to two and a half years something that we can do it, it is a give and take from what the binge model has created because you obviously want to make sure that there is some kind of quality content to what's happening but you also need to get the thing out while it's still fresh in people's minds with the streaming process people can go back and refresh themselves pretty conveniently in terms of availability not necessarily in terms of time because like i know ricky and i we started the witcher season three probably at the beginning of august and we were like what the hell happened in season two which like thankfully there is a recap but it's it's one of those things where you if you don't have the time to go back and watch a thing it's just lost to the ether because there's so much and i just i was listening to i think it was the brotherly love podcast uh, which is the uh, the Lawrence brothers, Joey, Matthew, and Andy Lawrence, uh, which I, I think, yeah, they're celebrity podcasts, but a lot of those are actually really kind of fun and good. Like, I, I love the Brotherly Love podcast because, like, you get so many interesting perspectives between the three of them because you have, like, the heart, the two heartthrobs between Joey and Matt, and then you have Andy, who he he he's basically become a voice actor. I know he did some like voice matching in the past and uh, but he he just he stopped doing screen work and he's done a lot of voice work and he he seems to be like of all of them probably the most well adjusted of all of them because he he wasn't the <laughs> one that was like sexualized but um they were talking about how like TGIF and just all these sitcoms friends everyone sat down at the same time every week And there's just this like energy of like, we're all experiencing this moment together. It's like what makes the Super Bowl so fun is that we're all watching these, this massive game where anything can happen at the same time. And it just, it creates this like weird ethereal magic that is just not there anymore. Yeah. It's water cooler shows. You know, the next you you watch it that night, you're excited with the people you watch with the next day you talk around the water cooler or, you know, or in my case, I was in middle school and I remember talking to people about Seinfeld because everybody watched Seinfeld, even though I didn't get like 70% of the jokes. <laughs> so yeah, it binging is an issue in that 
you know, do you watch it once or, you know, one or two episodes? Do you wait for it all to finish dropping? Do you, do you try to catch up to your friends? And then, you know, like my D and D group will be like, we catch up, you know, we play once a month or so. And someone will say, Hey, do you have, you know, what do you think of the show? Like, ah, did, 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 I'm only episode two or no, I haven't said, I haven't started yet. haven't started yet. Don't say anything. <laughs> yeah. So th- th- this is a really interesting tangent that maybe this is uh, an episode where we need to bring like a, a panel uh, on, like get a- Antonio and Justin and like Matt from Decaying with the boys or something on where we can talk about like, what, how do you fix something like this? But that's not necessarily what we dive into either, but we're a diverse group of people. We can talk about whatever the hell they, we want. And speaking of a diverse group of people um, from Australia, we have Tim, I'm going to say it's probably pronounced Huff. Uh, he's talking about a, a commercial from the 1990s, which just sent me down an, an amazing rabbit hole of commercials, uh, which I forgot commercials could be like 90 minutes or 90 seconds long. He, he's talking about this uh, product from Australia called Yogo Gorilla Yogurt. And he says various bits from this 90s classic yogurt ad uh, slash speed parody. In particular, the I'll get back to you, Barry, and ah, my lunch lines <laughs> delivered in, in this ad, which there's no real context for this, but you have to hear these lines. These lines are amazing. Uh, it's this weird claymation parody of speed with a gorilla and a snake. Uh, the snake is playing the Sandra Bullock character. And <laughs> I'm going to link this in the episode description because I do think this is something that needs to be seen by more people. Um, so here's the uh, I'll have to get back to you, Barry line. I'll get back to Barry. <laughs> his, his car got hit by the speeding bus. And then there's this line where uh, the bus is now going through a construction site and someone's uh, a rhinoceros is sitting down about to have his lunch and it gets knocked out of his hands. Ah, oh, my lunch. <laughs> you sent so many of these to me this week and I just am like, I, I don't, I don't get it, but I can't unhear it now. Oh, how can you not get it? It's I, fantastic. No, 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 no. I get it. It also kind of explains Australians a bit. <laughs> <laughs> if this is how they spent their Saturday mornings, definitely. Um, exactly. There's, there's also this like uh, airplane action one, which has a cliffhanger parody built into it. But also there's like an airplane reference where the, the lizard who's talking to Barry on the phone in the speed one is flying a plane and he's got an inflatable dummy next to him and on a pilot. Oh my God. And I'm just like, oh, how they sneak these things into kids things to try to get back on track with. We're supposed to be going through these quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is going to go a little long. We, I think no, we'll, I think we'll maybe say like four, four more. Now nah, we, we're just going through this. All right. <laughs> all right. So one for my wife, as I was walking over, you know, and she's like, what is this one about? And I you know, told and I kind of told her as I was walking into the room, she goes, shoot, shoot. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, Jurassic Park being the movie. I, I that that beginning of that movie is so expertly framed and built to, and that moment with him saying it and the, the close-ups of you know the raptor's face and the hand slipping away as the echo of shoot up. <sighs> yeah, no. <laughs> I honestly, as a kid, I didn't know he was saying shoot her. I didn't know he was saying that until I could watch it on VHS with captions. I was like, oh, that makes sense. (laughs) But I just thought he was just like yelling nonsensically or saying like the guy's name. And I'm like, what kind of name is shoot her? Uh, Another good one for that is I always thought that Ellie was okay. I'm, I'm flipping in my head. I either always thought she was saying shit in the car when they're being chased by the T-Rex and she's actually screaming shift because Uh. Malcolm is stuck on it. And so he's yelling, she's saying shift, shift, you know, like get us out of fucking second gear. Or I thought she was saying shift and she's actually saying shit. I don't remember now. I'm going to have to rewatch that movie for the 15th time this year. I think she's saying shift in that moment, but then there's another moment later in the movie where she is just going shit, shit. Yeah. So like I, I, it could be sh- swapped in your brain, but I do think you're right where she is saying shift and he, she can't because Malcolm or uh, Muldoon can't because uh, Malcolm is sitting on the, the, the shift uh, stick. <laughs> yeah. Another one from our friend, Brian P uh, in 
in boondock saints uh the is it dead i i don't have context for that one i wish i did yeah uh this is this is one that i definitely have in my brain i'm sure a lot of people do uh but nick gurney from uh our facebook post uh he said uh finding nemo he says i've fully incorporated dory's pronunciation of the word escape um, I don't know what he's trying to say here, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm right there with him. Uh, he also has adopted uh, Jess Perkins from the Do Go On podcast, another podcast I would recommend. Uh, anytime a year is mentioned, she has this bit where she just says, a good year. <laughs> and then if it ends in 69, she says, a very good year. <laughs> Chris Monk submit, submitted from American Pie. Go Trig, it's your birthday from the original American <laughs> Pie. Uh t- Anytime someone's going to do something amazing or impressive, I kind of am surprised that's the one that stuck, you know, because I think the one that sticks with everybody is this one time at bank. <laughs> but again, that's not the point of the, this episode is it's not uh, the iconic it. lines. It's, it's the weird ones that stick in your brain. Yeah. Uh, like, that is a weird uh, one. This he's a friend of the show, Mark Fleetwood. He was the guy who edited our frozen video that's on YouTube where again, this is why I don't read scripts. Uh, he's he has a line from Hot Fuzz where it says, "I'm not made of eyes," uh, which Hot Fuzz again, another endlessly quotable movie. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, a great big bushy beard, <laughs> crusty uh, jugglers, and then also a uh, hero of the podcast. Uh, Patty Considine is the man who walks out of frame, then comes back into frame, and then walks back out of frame. But that's like the most amazing gif ever, um, which again blows my mind that he also gave us like the greatest performance on TV in a long time with Game of Thrones, uh, House of the mm-hmm. Dragon. Hot Fuzz is just fantastic. It, my my personal just favorite thing about Hot Fuzz is that they had a love interest for uh, Simon Pegg, and they realized it wasn't working, so they just removed the love interest and gave all of her lines to Danny. <laughs> Yeah, why not? <laughs> Didn't swap most of them, just left them in. <laughs> just like, there you go. <laughs> and yeah. it works. Crusty jugglers. <laughs> the greater good. <laughs> the greater good. Shut up. Yeah. Uh, a quick one for me is uh, I should have some, talked about it during the Ghostbusters one, but Ghostbusters Afterlife. I like the movie, it worked for me. But when I'm thinking of something randomly emotional or I suddenly remember that um, Egon in real life has passed away, I then see Phoebe picking up the damn proton pack and fighting um, Zool all over again and frickin' just start tearing up. And it's terrible and I hate it because, damn it, one, Egon's dead in real life and two, such a good moment. I, seriously, she, and, and, and then, and then, spoiler, and then, ghostly egon's hands helps support her that that is oh oh, that is the moment that makes the third act tolerable for me because once it breaks down into we're just doing the third act from ghostbusters again uh i'm like okay Uh, and then that moment happens and the other ghostbusters show up i'm like okay we're i'm i'm back with you another uh uh god i'm skipping on his name what's the director's name from hot fuzz uh hot fuzz director yeah that guy uh, <laughs> uh also from scott pilgrim he also wrote the the original ant-man script and was supposed to direct it uh but then marvel was like you can't have creative freedom in a marvel movie what are you doing so he's like all right i'm gone and uh he also gave us the character of Luis, which i mean that makes that movie all the better uh mckay finley uh which we talked about them earlier says from scott pilgrim the bread makes you fat moment yeah uh, which that's fantastic Scott's talking with Ramona and uh, just like, I can eat bread all day. It can be bread for every meal. And she's like, yeah, but then you get fat. And he goes, bread makes you fat? And he like spits <laughs> out the bread. <laughs> Chris Peterson submitted for Return of the Living Dead. You mean the movie Lied? <laughs> Which I vaguely remember that movie. And I know I did that line wrong. But yeah, no, I know the, the scene. And that's just, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> so we have three left and two of them are mine but i'm gonna take one that's not mine (laughs) since we've been like going back and forth on this um jim piazza has a a few uh one of them is um my wife says i've been thinking to which i promptly response with respond with a dangerous pastime i know i know 
a dangerous pastime i know <laughs> there we go yep. <laughs> I, I, whenever is, uh, anyone says it's possible i want to reply with pig i might be bluffing <laughs> Uh, Zazu singing, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. And then from the weekly planet, planet podcast, there's a bit where uh, James and Meso, they'll just repeat each other's names if they start talking about uh, things that are just obviously correct. Uh, like James will talk about how um, animation has no budget because there's no need for it. You can do whatever you want. You can make an explosion as big as you want. You can do whatever, like clearly just like at Spider-Verse. And Mason will start talking about how like, well, clearly there has to be a budget because you have to understand how you pay people. And James will go, Mason, 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 Mason. And uh, so it's a fun bit that they do on their podcast. So I, I can understand that. The it's possible one, though, for me, I I, just, I go Rogers and Hammerstein. Like it, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> so I, I will completely agree with um, from Beauty and the Beast because no matter what, if my wife or I suddenly, you know, out of nowhere, we're just being quiet or we're talking about something. It's like, well, I've been thinking a dangerous pastime. I know <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, it's so dumb. And it's so good. And it, no matter how serious the voice is, like the voice or the conversation that we're about to have is, so I've been thinking immediately the other is like a dangerous pastime. <laughs> <laughs> Lafu, my friend, I've been thinking. A, a dangerous, dangerous pastime. I know. <laughs> so, Josh, I want you to tell you why you think so much about RoboCop shooting a guy in the dick. <laughs> well, I mean, I was four years old, and I don't know what happened. Like, as I got older, I know what happened. But, like, I do not understand how RoboCop shooting through a lady's dress makes the guy start screaming and writhing in pain. How does that work? <laughs> But now that I know what it is, four-year-old Josh is extraordinarily traumatized, but also finds it <laughs> hilarious because the guy got shot in the dick. But I don't know <laughs> if you've seen this, but there's a viral picture. Like if you mm -hmm. look for um, Peter Weller uh, Comic-Con or something like that, there's a picture of him with a young lady who has a shirt that says, do you remember the time Robocop shot that guy in the dick? <laughs> yep. And he looks happy to see that <laughs> shirt. <laughs> he is very happy about it. And then uh, the the last one we have is another one of mine, which I did not intend for mine to be the last one. It's from the Angry Beavers, and it's it's from the episode where Norbert and Daggett are collecting box tops to get cereal prizes. And Daggett is trying to cheat the system and do whatever, and Norbert is not letting him. And at one point, once he gets he's trying to get through to Daggett that he can get this street sweeper if he collects enough box tops. But the way he says street sweeper, I've said this before on the show, but he he's like, you can get your very own street sweeper. <laughs> and it, like the that is the line they choose, to, like repeat a, a few times. Like there's the the moment where like the calendar pages are falling off the wall and you see Daggett like transparently through the, the calendar and he's just getting fat, eating all this cereal. And you just hear street sweeper street sweeper street sweeper <laughs> <laughs> like the way nick bacase delivers that line just is embedded in my brain and i i hear that probably once per day similar to the yo stacy like i i can't not hear it and whenever there is a street sweeper on the road i go street sweeper <laughs> So not to steal your thunder with the last one, but one suddenly popped into my head that go for it. it. It's so dumb. So this was years ago. Um, there was a family guy where they did a cutaway gag to, they did a cutaway gag to Ava Braun and Hitler, like trying to get each other to commit suicide together. And I know like, exactly what yeah, you're talking about. Yes. And, um, they're like, oh, you were going to do it. You were going to do it. You suck. You suck. <laughs> my my wife and I were carrying groceries in the house. And so we lived on the second floor of this apartment building. And we had, you know, done our shopping for like the you know, two weeks or whatever. And so we're trying to wrestle with the store. We, we have all the bags slung on our arms. And we're trying to wrestle with the storm door. And she's trying to get like the inner door while I'm holding it. And like something slips, the bags start to fall or something like that. And out of nowhere, I just go, you suck. You suck. <laughs> and then she starts laughing so hard. She ends up like kneeling down, just laughing because then she's going back to me like, you weren't going to do it. 
Uh, last yeah. one, just because that reminded me, um, uh, another one we got on our Facebook thread, uh, some, I, I, I apologize for not getting the name just cause I've already closed out all my browsers. Um, someone mentioned that the, the, the way the scary door is delivered in uh, Futurama segments where they, they watch the twilight zone rip off where they're like, maybe it's a, maybe it's a small window. Maybe it's a bigger door, whatever it is. It's behind the scary door. <laughs> <laughs> and that there's there's a scary door sequence where they're making fun of like oh what the hell is it oh it's the the um William Shatner one where there's like a, a gremlin on the on the wing of the plane and they're they're taking off and the guy's like there's a gremlin on the plane he's like why should I believe you you're Hitler <laughs> and, he, and then he like they cut back to him and then he he just goes Ava Braun we need help <laughs> Ava Braun's like a fly with a wig on or something. <laughs> But that's another one that sticks in my brain is the why should I believe you? You're Hitler. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> the only time that sentence should be mentioned with your Hitler. <laughs> yeah, we were talking yeah. about Futurama earlier today, and like this is one of the things that they need to try and get back to is just the the innocuous satire of shit. Yeah, not, I mean not just surface level nonsense. Yeah, I'm hoping the next season's better. I mean, this one, this one's fine. Oh, weird. I, I think I just heard Justin Henson from the movie wire screaming obscenities that it's better than fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard Becky yelling at me from St. Louis yelling, you fuckers are watching without me. Oh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, this was a, I, I will say, I, I personally had a lot of fun with this. It was this a good episode. Yeah, idea. I, I like this uh, this segment a lot, so I think we will definitely bring it back. Um, if you want to send us your suggestions on this, if we have if we put out a call to action, or if you just want us to bank one, please join our Discord. We can make a a special uh, thread just for for rent free moments. Um, you can join us uh, on the Discord through the link in the episode description. You can also email us at teasmacpod at gmail dot com. And with that, we're going to start getting out of here. Alex, this again has been a lot of fun. We went a little yeah. longer than we normally do, That's but right. I think it was kind of worth it. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> just so you know, wait, why well, don't I hear theme music yet? I haven't started it yet because oh. it, 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 it kicks in real quick. And so I usually start like, I, I started too early and then I'm like, we're still talking and I can't, we don't want to be like, all right, yeah, let's, I'll, I'll click the button now. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, and of course, you know, this week's music is by Edgar Wright, who decided, who's now branching out from writing and directing to doing our theme music. <laughs> writing and directing Hot Fuzz, uh, write, writing the Ant-Man script, and um, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. You know, that that guy, you know, the guy that yeah. we named earlier. Yeah. Uh, don't forget uh, to like, subscribe, comment, review on your favorite podcatcher of choice. Follow us on all the social medias, Blue Sky Instagram threads, Hive Social, Post News, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok lonnie's website and whatever else the hell they're coming out with uh thank you to leo allen for our musical themes thank you to beppo for our original avatars retro studios for our ricky avatar again please like subscribe rate review send us your suggestions for future rent free moments i'm throwing up my hands again because i'm so like jacked about this episode it's a lot of fun uh but thank you so much everyone for listening take care have a great week and don't forget to listen to massive month we are talking to melissa flores next week We'll be right back. We'll be back in on Monday. I'm rambling. Got to Alex, cut this shit out. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't forget to listen to Massive Month. Our bonus episode's coming out. Melissa Flores is up next. Listen to me, Barry. You have to watch Star Trek. <laughs> Who loves T Smack? I love T Smack. You know, Is it thinking. true? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do, I do. Ooh. There's a rent free moment. <laughs> I just had Keenan and Kel pop into my head. Why?